on March 22nd, 1996, Space Shuttle Atlanta, shown here, took off from Edwards Air Force Base in California. On board for the mission to the Mir station were six astronauts, including Rich Clifford. Rich, who a graduate from West Point and Georgia Tech, was making his third flight into space. On this journey, Atlantis would dock with the Russian space station Mir. And there, Rich performed a six-hour spacewalk, 223 miles above the Earth's surface. Two years earlier, in 1994, Dr. Joseph Jankovic at Baylor College of Medicine had diagnosed our friend and colleague, Rich Clifford, with Parkinson's disease. Rich, what goes through your mind when you see that video? On memories. This is great. The launches are fantastic, and the opportunity to walk in space is fantastic. It was a special privilege. So you've said that uh, the launches are a thrill. What's it like to be uh, hooked up in Space Shuttle Atlantis getting ready for takeoff? Well, it's kind of kind of calm because there's nothing you can do right now. <laughs> Just sitting on the back and uh, you're, you're hoping thing, thing that goes off on time because uh, it gets uncomfortable in those suits. But uh, the minute it launches, you're just, you're just hanging on. I know when I was sitting there on the, in the countdown, it goes from six down, down to one, at the main engine's ignition at six seconds, six seconds before, you feel a slight tremor in the, in the vehicle. It bounces, bends on the pad. And then uh, once it comes back to zero, the solid rocket motors ignite, and then you're, you're along for the ride. It is, it's a violent, expand, violent event. <laughs> And then on this mission, uh, you're one of six astronauts, and then you make, I think, one of the longest uh, spacewalks ever. Uh, they're, they're usually generated for six hours. And tell us what that's like. Well, it's, it's great. When you get out in a suit, uh, you're, uh, you're fully protected from the environment, the lack of environment. But uh, what you, it's like you've been there before because you've done it so, much, so many times in the water where we simulate the, the zero gravity environment and the zero, zero force. And, uh, it, uh, when you get out there and you're playing with the tools, it's really good because you, you know, all you gotta do is, is touch something and you bounce away from it. So I like to say go, go slow is the best way to do it because you only have to do it once. Because you know, we and can move. So, and so the remarkable thing, this was your third mission into space, but this one, you were, went into space as a NASA astronaut two years after you had been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Yes. When I got diagnosed with Parkinson's, I thought it, I thought it was over. And uh, NASA asked me what I wanted to do. I said, you mean it's up to me? And I said, yeah, we, we consider you still qualified for flight. And I said, well, then I'll go, I'll go fly again. And uh, that was, it was as easy as that. But one it's, of my colleagues was telling me that NASA is a pretty risk averse uh, organization. Parkinson's disease wasn't nearly as widely known in 1994 as it is uh, today. Uh, what were their thoughts and what were your thoughts? Well, their, their thoughts were um, the people that choose you for space flights are based on your performance and your uh, medical recommendation. The medical community considered me uh, diagnosed with Parkinson's, but, but not showing any of the symptoms of it, really. Okay, so I, they, they gave me the flight clearance and NASA assigned me to another mission. And it was, it was special because I'd done a lot of the preparatory work on that. And I'd done all the EVA uh, simulation and validation of the positions and equipment you're going to use. So it was, it was an easy, easy decision for them to fly me. It, it, it speaks well of NASA that uh, they, base their, they base their assignments on Proven it does well, and you performed all elements of the mission. You all elements of the mission. Yes. Uh, yes. So when you're uh, either leading up to the launch, during the launch, or why I think you were in space for seven days, if I recall correctly, um, did you notice your Parkinson's? No, I didn't. I had, I I felt my tremor. I felt my right hand had a tremor at one time, but uh, it was it was very mild. And you can probably, you know, I didn't tell the rest of the crew that I had it because I told, I told the commander because he, he should know 
And he said, you don't have to tell anybody else. And it's, not, it's nothing for them to worry about. And was your Parkinson's affected by being in space? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. no, no restraints. I'm sorry? There's no restraints. You're, you know, you're, you're just hold on to something. And uh, I, I, did, I, did, I did notice a tremor, but uh, which I didn't have in, in, uh, on the ground. And did you feel like your Parkinson's got better or worse in space or any change? You're the only person who can answer this question. Yeah, I, I think it, um, it, it showed more in space. It what? I could feel it more in space. It's, it's amazing. Uh, yeah, talking about that, when we re-entered uh, for landing, uh, I noticed um, my, when my the, when the pull the g-forces that my hands would go down, and it would it was much easier to work with them. So uh, last week was another big week in space. Uh, this past Saturday, a private company called SpaceX. Uh, one of the companies that Elon Musk leads launched two NASA astronauts into space. Uh, did you watch yes, it? I did. I was glued to the TV. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what were your thoughts? I thought that, uh, that uh, I hope the thing goes off on time because uh, they, only had, they only had a small window that they could launch it. And uh, the, the weather broke at the right time and allowed them to go. And I, I thought, I thought this, is what, this is what we should be doing, is uh, launching people in space and launching uh, commercial vehicles because NASA has proved the technology. It's now time to turn it over, turn that technology over to the private sector and let them go on. And if they can make a profit, they'll work for it. If not, then they'll, they'll just go out of business. But it's, it, it was pretty remarkable to see that vehicle. The, the SpaceX rocket, the Falcon 9, was, uh, was ready to go, and it was good. And, and to, see the, to see them ride the the Tesla limo is over to the launch pad is something else. So what do you think about, what's the future of space exploration? I think that um, we still have a, a, a model to do in space exploration. We, we gotta, we're gonna go back to the moon uh, and uh, we're gonna try to go to asteroids and Mars. Those are pretty far out devices, far out places. We've got that. We, one again, we're going we're to be in the mode of proving that we can do it and do it safely. So there's, there's questions you got to answer. How, how, are you, how, how, how can you take so long to get to Mars? What are you going to do while you're on the route? And there's logistical problems for that. You got got to have all your supplies with you. You know, that's too big a rocket. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to see humans on Mars. I think we will, but um, it's a long way off. Are you, are you going to be ready for your fourth mission into space? I'd take another one. <laughs> yeah. That's a special privilege. Uh, outstanding, outstanding. Uh, now I'm going to turn a little bit to Parkinson's disease. Um, we know that certain pesticides and chemicals like trichloroethylene uh, contribute to Parkinson's disease. We detail them uh, in our book. Uh, you were exposed to both uh, pesticides and this chemical trichloroethylene, uh, also known as TCE. Uh, can you tell us? Thank you. <laughs> What's that sticker on the book? Oh, it's a pre pre. Free, that's freedom copy. Oh, outstanding. Well, thank you. Uh, Rich is uh, quoted in the book. Um, so you got exposed to both pesticides and TCE. Can you tell us a little bit about your exposure to pesticides? Yeah, my pesticide exposure was uh, mainly when I was flying. Uh, as, as a private pilot, and uh, when, I, when I did a job in high school uh, cutting grass, and uh, spraying pesticides and, and oh, nasty stuff. But it was, um, I was exposed uh, without knowledge of something. I, I didn't know that it was dangerous. I didn't like the way it sm smelled, but it was, um, it was, it was a, just a job. And then I worked in a, was a gas station attendant 
and uh, got, got exposed to trichloroethane. With, uh, I'll come to that in a second. So the pesticides, were you flying the plane? No, I wasn't. Oh, okay. The pesticides were, uh, were just ground, ground applied. And uh, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't have any pesticides when I was flying. Then you grew up in Ogden, Utah. And uh, did you grow up in a rural area and did you drink well water? No, I didn't drink well water, but I did when I went to visit my grandpa in Rock Springs, Wyoming. Yeah, they had a well up there as well as uh, coal mines that he worked in. Uh, but I didn't, I didn't have any exposure to that. Uh, and did you have any family history of Parkinson's disease? No, not at all. Um, so you got a little exposure with pesticides working as a teenager uh, and landscaping. Um, and then you, you got exposed to trichloroethylene, you said first working a, as a gas station attendant. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, uh, I'm, my job there was to service the gas for the people that wanted it. And I also started working in the, in the shop. And in the shop there, we'd, we'd get grease spills all the way and I'd have to go clean it up. And so I was, I didn't, I didn't realize it was a nasty kind of chemical in it, but, but I, it was, it was efficient at cleaning up the uh, grease. And so I, I did that for about two years. And most people don't know about TCE. Can you tell us what TCE is? Were you pouring it from a jug or what, what, what is TCE and how were you using it? I was using it in, in a bottle and I poured it on the concrete. And um, just clean it up, and I, I, I breathe a lot of it. Just you do that by putting your hand around and with the rags. And I also got exposed to it uh, as a maintenance officer in the army, flying. Uh, I I was doing test flights, and I would have to do an do an engine change and have to get it all cleaned up, and we do the, clean the engine by blowing trichloroethylene based products through the engine firing up and it would clean it out and you, you naturally get exposed to the, to the camera. And uh, so just so people know that uh, your experience uh, isn't unique, let me see if we can get this up here. Um, many occupations have a risk of exposure. It sounds like you had two occupations, one just working as a gas station attendant, sounds like as a teenager or a young man uh, using it to clean up Grease spills and then using it again in the military in the army when you're using it to clean engines. Uh, here's just the list, a simple list of occupations that have a risk of exposure, including refrigerant manufacturers, dry cleaners, mechanics, oil processors, printers, rubber cementers, shoemakers, tobacco, uh, denicotinizers. <laughs> uh, taxidermists, sewage workers, silk screeners. I learned about embalmers. Uh, are also using it. It's also used in flame retardants, insecticides, polyvinyl chloride, uh, in the manufacturing of polyvinyl chloride, and the manufacturing of disinfectants, perfumes, soaps, dyes, pharmaceuticals. It was used as an anesthetic. It was used to decaffeinate coffee in the 1970s. Uh, the list of applications is long. Uh, when you say this, what do you think, uh, Rich? I think that's a, that's a broad list. It probably covers most of the stuff I did. <laughs> and it turns out that 8% of workers in England have been exposed to uh, TCE in the process of working. And it's likely a similar number have been exposed in the U.S. Uh, it does have a distinct smell. Can you tell us a little bit about the smell? Yeah, it's, it's like an abrasive. When you, when you inhale, your, your nostrils expand quite a bit. It's irritating. And then uh, can you tell us when you found out about it harm that it had harmful effects? When did you first learn that? Um, probably through you. <laughs> yeah, because I, I, I never paid attention. Working as a gas station attendant, you didn't know about it in the military. You didn't know about it at NASA. You didn't know until after you were diagnosed with Parkinson's disease? Yes. No, I, no, I, I've been informed. Uh, I knew it wasn't wasn't good stuff. If it's cleaning grease, it's it's, it's bad. But it, um, 
I, I, I was aware of the hazard, but I accepted it. Um, so we talk about uh, TCE a lot in the book. Um, this is a passage uh, talking about uh, TCE. And if you can see that, uh, that picture, that correspondence is a letter to the editor in JAMA, the Journal of American Medical Association, um, mm -hmm. called The Toxicity of Trichloroethylene. It was uh, written by Dr. Terry McCord from Cincinnati, Ohio, my hometown. He worked at Chrysler Corporation. He wrote uh, about the toxicity of trichloroethylene in a letter to the editor of one of the top medical journals. And I'm gonna read you a little bit of what he said. Uh, as far back as 1932, so this is before anyone listening is likely born, Dr. Kerry McCord, a medical advisor for Chrysler Corporation in Cincinnati, Ohio, wrote a letter to the Journal of the American Medical Association. It was titled, The Toxicity of Trichloroethylene. Uh, McCord began his letter, promotional activities seeking the extension of industrial uses of trichloroethylene frequently fail to disclose the toxic nature of this chemical and the practical dan dangers that may attend its use. He went on, in industry, trichloroethylene may enter the body through the breathing of vapors or through the skin. McCord de detailed the lethal effects of different concentrations of TCE from an inhalation, which sounds like the way you were exposed to it, and skin absorption. Were you exposed to it on your skin? No, we wore gloves. Um, it, naturally, you walk through the vapor and get on your skin. Uh, based on studies done on rabbits, he concluded, quote, any manufacturer contemplating the use of trichloroethylene may find in it many desirable qualities. It's great as a degreasing agent. Two, in the absence of closed systems of operation, he may find in this solvent the source of disaster, source of disaster for exposed workmen. Yeah. When you hear that. Yeah, well, it's nice to know that now. Uh, I was aware of that it, it wasn't a, wasn't a good thing to do, but you had to, that's what we had available to us. And uh, so I, I just, I think it, all good things in life come with hazards. And um, if, you, if you're not willing to accept that, you shouldn't be doing it risking. Uh, these hazards we know about, we've known about the hazards of trichloroethylene for 90 years. Some countries have banned trichloroethylene, the United States hasn't. To the extent we know things for 90 years, we should be able to stop using chemicals from the 1990s, I mean, not from 90 years ago. I'm not sure what space aircraft looked like in 1932, but my guess is you couldn't go uh, very far with uh, <laughs> spacecraft in the 1930s. And it sounds like we could do this, we could get better chemicals uh, than ones that are known to be toxic from 90 years ago. You're right on. And uh, we, we should be getting rid of these. Levels. There's got to be some uh, an alternative out there. And it's going to take um, somebody pushing it, like you are, to get, this, to get this done. We're getting lots of questions. We're going to get to them in just a second. Um, just to close the loop, we've uh, NASA used the chemical since the 1950s as a degreaser for metal parts in early rocket engine testing and maintenance. But it sounds like you weren't exposed to TCE while you were at NASA. Uh, not directly. I was I was when I was an engineer there, getting just before my astronaut days. I did work uh, the, the inspections of the rocket motors after after launch, the, re the reusable segments. So I, mean, I was I was exposed to it, but I, no more than anybody else. Um, you've been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease now for 26 years, if I did my math correctly, but you actually hid your diagnosis for many years. Uh, what made you decide to come forward with your diagnosis? I felt it was time. To, uh, I can. It was time to, to reveal it. Uh, I I struggled with it for a while, but it was it was becoming apparent that I had something else wrong with me, and uh, I I felt it was a good thing for the community for me to announce that I had Parkinson's disease, and I, and I went on the speaking circuit for a while, and uh, it was it was it was useful. 
because I, I, my message was just because you have Parkinson's, is you don't have to give up. And uh, that's, I continued on with my endeavor. Um, when did you go, when did you make your uh, diagnosis public? Did that in, uh, oh, yeah, 2011. 2011. So well after you were diagnosed, looking back, would you handle things any differently? I don't think so. I, I was happy with what I was And I was, I was working for Boeing at the time, and I didn't think anybody needed to know. Because, uh, I, like I said, I didn't have, it, didn't have symptoms that were evident. And um, it was, but when I stopped working, it was time to relieve and get the, uh, get the issue out on the table. And um, Dr. Jankovic's son, uh, Dr. Jankovic uh, bugged me for a while about getting a movie out there. He said that it, he convinced me that it would be good for the audience and good for the community that, uh, that they could see what you can do with parking. And so I, I, I relented and he, had, he, made it, he made the movie easy for me because his son was a film producer. And I did, did the movie. And so that movie, I think, is called An Astronaut's Secret, if I recall correctly. And maybe Abby will uh, be able to put the link in the chat. Is that, you want to tell us a little bit about the movie? Yeah, the movie's great. It, uh, it uh, features my family and uh, my, my journey through, uh, through the disease. Uh, it's got launch photos and um, mission photos from my three missions. And it, uh, it's just a, it's a wonderful story about life with Parkinson's and uh, how you don't give up. And uh, just, you're going you're gonna to feel different, but you can't give up. And that's the, that's the movie. That's what it's about. Well, we have lots of questions from lots of your admirers. Amber Bennett says you are an, an incredible human being, Rich. I'm so inspired by you, as I am uh, Peter Di Diamatis. Do you think we as a community should ask if X Prize can do an end Parkinson's X Prize? I think they've done so for Alzheimer's. Yeah, it's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. I could see that. Sally Swope asked, uh, do you think of yourself as having grit? And then how did you develop this to cope with Parkinson's disease? Um. I guess I have a little bit of grit in me. Uh, I'm willing to accept challenges. Uh, I, I, the thing is, the challenges were always fun for me. Uh, from, from test pilot school to test pilot, test flying, uh, to the astronaut days, I was, I was always always there to take another challenge. And, uh, and so uh, Rich is also a humble guy. I think you graduated at the top of your class in, uh, test, in pilot school, is that, is that right? Yes, I was the first. Uh, Pamela Quinn, one of our great uh, friends in New York City, asked, how does NASA retrain people's proprioceptive skills when they return from space? Specifically, I'm wondering if they have an approach that can be adapted to people with Parkinson's disease who tend to lose their spatial awareness. Yeah, I tell you, losing the, the ability to smell probably goes in Uh I, how we trained them, we didn't really pay attention to that. Um, the flight surgeons looked at us all the time. And um, you, you, just, you just adapt back to the environment you're in. Were there any trainings that NASA did uh, for you as an astronaut that you think might apply to people with Parkinson's disease? Well, I'll tell you, wearing those suits is good because it restrains you. It stops your vibrations. Uh, we could probably probably do use those Tesla suits. <laughs> it, it, it does. It, it's a it's a remarkable achievement to wear those suits, the launch and entry suits, the orange we call them orange pumpkin suits, because they they do control the environment for you, and uh, they, it, it's a it's a handy thing to have. Uh, you don't, you don't, you don't walk around in them because they're so, they're so way heavy. But uh, I don't know. I think 
my readaptation to Earth's environment was pretty automatic. And um, I think it's just the training just gets you there. Uh, Jim Reed asked, I've written and performed a comic monologue in which I fantasize about walking on the moon. Instead of my usual Parkinson's shuffle, the low gravity allows me to walk normally without any effort. Is that ridiculous or could there be some truth to it? Taking big steps is good. Yeah. And, uh, it's, Was it easier to walk in space with your Parkinson's? Did you feel it's less effect? Well, I didn't feel there was any effect because um, walking in space is, is really crawling. You're, you're using your hands for everything. And you use your feet to restrain yourself so you can do a large, large mass movement. And so you, you, you got to you get your feet into the foot restraints, and then you can bend your upper body and do everything you want to. Uh, and it's, you know, we, we, we installed three experiment packages on the Mirror Space Station. And these things were the size of a large Samsonite suitcase and weighed about 150 pounds. And I could just, I could just drag it along with my fingernails. And it was, it, was, it was neat. You're, you're superhuman up there. Jim Reed is, uh, is, is riding quickly. Superhuman up there. Um, Amy Carlson uh, says, what meds were you taking when you went into space? And did your Parkinson's change when you were in space? Uh, I didn't take any medicines before the space flight. I, I didn't take any up there. I was not on Cinemet then. Um, were you on Selegiline or Eldapril? I thought I read that you were, were you taking that at the time or were you taking no medicines at all for your Parkinson's? Yeah, that's what they diagnosed or gave me as Eldapril. I did take Eldapril up there, yes. And I was, I said my symptoms were so slight, it didn't, didn't make a difference. And I, I, I stayed on up, up there and um, really it was, it's been, for several years after that, that uh, it became apparent that I, I, needed some, I went on Cinemet. So in space, you're taking Eldapril in the morning? Yes. Yeah. He acts like this is no big deal. Um, what is your, uh, Amy Carlson asked a follow-up, what's your movement regimen now? What's your exercise uh, routine like now? It's cut down quite a bit. I, I walk. Uh, I walk with my wife, we walk daily, we try to, but it's not too hot. And I, I also do the, uh, the big exercises, uh, yoga-like exercises, and uh, I golf. So Dave Malarkey asks you, I admire you, Rich. I'm wondering how you maintain your golf swing. <laughs> you see, he goes where he wants to. <laughs> Dave Malarkey, uh, are you on there, Dave? That's good. Um, I just try hard, but it's fun. I, I get the exercise out of golf that, uh, that I miss. I used to be pretty much in shape, and uh, it's gone away from me. A very COVID-friendly sport, golf. Yeah, it is. Um. Dan Keller asks, is there any association of professional pilots developing Parkinson's disease or PSP, progressive supernuclear palsy? Uh, no, not that I know. Um, most people that try to keep it, most pilots try to keep it a secret if they have something like that. Uh, do you know of other people who were exposed to TCE who developed Parkinson's disease or other Parkinsonian disorder? I don't know them by, by name, but I, I've seen them. And it's, a, it's, it's an environment that you, that you just get used to, uh, depending on how you, how you were raised. And uh, I, I don't know. I haven't seen anybody. Nobody's, nobody's confessed to me about the TCE. So I think, you know, in our book, uh, we highlight that the HIV activists in the 1980s, when they were confronted with a pandemic that was uh, uniformly fatal, they adopted the motto of silence equals death. And for the Parkinson's community, I think silence equals suffering and needless suffering. The sooner we end the silence, whether it's pilots being exposed to TCE or farmers exposed to pesticides, 
the sooner we end this disease. Yes, I agree. And I, I, I applaud your book for that. You, you went through details after details of your research and uh, extensive, extensive look at people with, uh, with the disease and, and how, they, how they got it. And so that's, that's good. We gotta follow the recommendations in your book about getting rid of this, and the environment, environmental cleanup. Because this is a preventable disease. I think if there's one thing we want people to take away from this is that we can prevent people from ever developing Parkinson's disease. We can come up with other degreasing agents that don't increase the risk of Parkinson's disease by 600%. Exactly. And making, making awareness of it, what your book is good for. Uh, Amy Carlson says, did you feel you were diagnosed earlier than many others because you were working with NASA? I think I was diagnosed early, yes. Uh, I probably, probably had to be because of the uh, close scrutiny you get to on the medical exams. And, um, but that was good. Getting identified with Parkinson's at an early age was beneficial to my long-term health. And you worked for, how many more years at NASA did you work with Parkinson's disease? Um, I worked till 2012. At NASA with Parkinson's disease? Yes. Eight years? Yes. And then you worked at Boeing after that? Um, that was then including Boeing. Uh, I, I stopped working for NASA in 1997. In 97, so three years with NASA and then five more, or then? Eight more, eight more with Boeing. With, uh, with uh, Boeing. He doesn't give up, um, Rich Clifford. Um, hmm. <laughs> Amy Lindbergh says, what can we do to decrease the toxin buildup in our bodies if we already have Parkinson's disease? Are there detox diets, chelation therapies, or powdered binders under uh, consideration? Um, so I'll take this one, Rich. Uh, <laughs> uh, we don't know. Um, there have been some studies of chelation therapy which really haven't shown to be a benefit. Uh, I think the biggest thing we can do is stopping the exposure. So we didn't mention that TC contaminates up to about 30% of groundwater and in the United States. Uh, well water, which is often contaminated with pesticides, is that associated with an increased risk, 50 to 150% increased risk of Parkinson's disease. So I think minimizing ongoing or stopping ongoing exposure by testing your well, eating foods with less pesticides, uh, avoiding TCE. TCE is also found in half of Superfund sites throughout the United States and in thousands of other contaminated sites around the country, including one 15 minutes from my home in uh, Pittsburgh, New York, which I found about reading the book. Uh, so we don't know how to remove it. Actually, the only way some of these things are removed is in the breast milk of nursing mothers. Some of these pesticides dissolve in fat and dissolve in milk, and they're then passed on to their kids. Again, we detail all these harrowing uh, truths uh, in the book, Ending Parkinson's Disease, and we provide you 800 references uh, to learn more about the research if you would really like the research, and we provide you very user-friendly uh, resources at the EPA and others. And then ask, are these chemicals still in broad use in the United States and abroad? So EPA has failed to ban trichloroethylene. Other European countries have banned it, and levels of TCE in the air, for example, in the Netherlands have decreased, uh, but they have not been banned in the United States. It's still permitted for a couple of uses. We need to end and ban TCE, and we need to clean up the de uh, the de de clean up the contaminated sites. Amazing how much that's in the water. Yes. Global use of trichloroethylene is expected to increase at 2% per year. So while some countries have seen the benefits, its global use is projected to increase 2% per year, and in China at 4% per year. Some of these pesticides, including Paraquat, have been banned by 32 countries, including China, but have not been banned in the United States. And again, we give you, uh, the, in the book, we give some of these black pages at, at the end are your prescription for action. And the very first uh, prescription for action drum roll is to prevent Parkinson's disease by banning paraquat and trichloroethylene. And you can email the EPA administrator, Andrew Wheeler, and we give you his email address and his phone number. It'd be great to let him know your thoughts about the continued use of chemicals and pesticides associated with Parkinson's disease. 
Yeah, if, it, if it's preventable, you gotta be able to do it. There's no, there's no reason to hold on to those chemicals. Uh, Tim Sawula, uh, uh, apologies on the pronunciation, asks you, Rich, do you have favorite vitamins that you see great results from? I take vitamin D and um, melatonin. Uh, that's, all, that's still the vitamins I take. Uh, Bev Ribaldo asks, is TCE, TCE used to clean auto, uh, auto parts in repair shops or was it used back in the 1970s? Uh, do you know if it's still used to clean auto parts? I don't know. I, I think in the U.S. it's not, it's not the primary uses are in refrigeration and another uh, use that um, I can't recall. Um, but I think it wasn't, it was later than the 1970s uh, that it was used in repair shops. We tell the story of Danny Fromm uh, in the book who was using it in the, in the aerospace industry in Southern California in 1988. So my guess is that it, it's been used uh, well after the 1970s. And I have other patients who have worked as mechanics who use TCE or likely use TCE uh, more recently than the 1970s. Is it, is it part of a refrigerant? Yes, it's a re use it in refrigeration, yes. Yeah, that's, that's probably where a lot of people get exposed to. That use is still permitted. Uh, Rich, when did you start using medications to treat your Parkinson's disease? I started in 19... Um, 2000, I think. Um, uh, related to that, James Cosper asked, have you had deep brain stimulation? No, I haven't. I, just, I don't think Thoughts on deep brain stimulation or why you haven't decided to go to deep brain stimulation? Yeah, I just don't want a hole drilled in my head. It might leak out. Honestly, that's, that's, why, that's why I haven't done it. All right. Uh, Amy Lindbergh asked, have you seen any UFOs on your missions? Not that I can talk about. <laughs> uh, what's your most annoying sim symptom and how do you manage it? Uh, to be honest with you, my, my, my most annoying symptoms are the uh, results of my medication, the, the byproduct of the medication. I, I, get, I get constipation, I get um, dyskinesia, and all, all of those are trailed back to some of the drugs I take. So dyskinesia is definitely related to the medications, especially levodopa. Constipation is actually part of the disease itself in most cases. And actually constipation, like the loss of smell that you experience, can begin decades before uh, developing tremor and slowness of movement. When did you lose your sense of smell? It's been 10 years or more. But did you, learn, did you lose it before you uh, developed the tremor and the uh, slowness of movement? Yes. Um, and so we talk about in the book, we think it's not a coincidence that some of the earliest symptoms of Parkinson's disease, loss of smell and constipation are tied to the routes of exposure that people get to the disease, whether it's TCE being inhaled, pesticides being inhaled, or pesticides being ingested, or TCE being ingested and contaminated groundwater. So these, if you look at people's brains, actually the pathology of Parkinson's disease is found most prominently and most early in something called the olfactory bulb, which it, olfaction is just smell, which is the smell center in the brain. That's where you first see the pathology of Parkinson's disease before you see in the parts of the brain that are responsible for tremor or uh, slow movement. Yeah, and the most prevalent thing to me was taste. If you can't smell something, you said you said you lost your sense of taste as well. Yes, I think yeah. that was loss of a smell. Uh, I, I, I don't have any. I don't have any odors. I can walk out outside now and, and breathe that air, and, it's, and I'm not going. I'm not going to smell something that's out there. And then, uh, so you said that you were diagnosed in 1994. One uh, listener asked, uh, when did you first experience symptoms looking back? Of, did you notice that your arm was, I think your loss of arm swing was one of the first things you commented on. Yes, 
And it was, that was, that was it. My right arm. Most of my symptoms exist on the right side of my body. And how long, uh, how long before you were diagnosed had you noticed that your right arm wasn't swinging? Uh, it's, it's six months before the flight. Yeah. And so that would have been, been 1995, most likely. And I just noticed, I, when I walk down the hall, you, you can see my, my arm doesn't roll, doesn't roll. And it, uh, that was what Dr. Jankovic said, so, and my flight surgeon saw. And that, was, that was a diagnosis based on the lack of arm movement. Um, Dan Keller uh, produces a, a podcast series for the Parkinson's Foundation. There were two relevant episodes based on our conversation with you, Rich. Number 57 is discussing talking to one's employer and coworkers about a Parkinson's disease diagnosis. Most people's employers aren't NASA, most of their coworkers aren't fellow astronauts, but I'm sure there could be some useful pearls in Dan's podcast. And number four talks about workplace accommodations for people with disabilities. Uh, it's quite remarkable that you, you've demonstrated what people with Parkinson's disease can do when they don't give up, including uh, walking in space. Yes. I, I, I like those comments. And I, I still, still like to walk around and act like I, I don't have Parkinson's, but it's, it's apparent. <laughs> And then we'll put, maybe Abby can put this in the chat. The series is at parkinson.org, B-A-R-K-I-N-S-O-N.org forward slash podcast. Uh, the uh, Parkinson's Foundation puts out uh, great uh, educational resources uh, about Parkinson's disease and about living with Parkinson's disease. And we're fortunate that Dr. Michael Oaken, uh, the medical officer, medical chief medical director uh, for the Parkinson's Foundation is one of our great authors. Um, it's a your your book is is amazing. It, it ought to be required reading for anybody with Parkinson's or anybody that thinks they're going to have it. Um, but, uh, it's very definitive and uh, easy to read, and it's got tons of data in it. I, I applaud you for that. Thank you. I mean, given you're giving us a, a little plug, we're going to show people how easy it is to get the book. Um, if you just go to uh, Amazon and you type in ending Parkinson's disease, you will uh, find our book. And here it is. It's bookmarked for me. Uh, so right now, you can just order it right now on Amazon. Amazon has it discounted. You can save $10 off the cover price. We have no influence on the pricing uh, and purchase it right now. Again, all the authors are donating their proceeds to efforts to end Parkinson's disease. All the proceeds from, that the authors are receiving are being devoted uh, to efforts to end Parkinson's disease. If this price is too much, and we do not want cost to be a barrier, so if you can't afford the book, just email us at info at endingpd.org and we'll send you a free copy. So if you can't afford the book, we'll send you a copy of the book. Uh, just email us at info at endingpd.org. If you can afford the book, we'd be delighted for you to purchase it. And then if you uh, either receive it or however you get it, we'd love you to review the book. You, uh, we thank the 108 people who have reviewed the book uh, to date. All you do is click on uh, ratings, and then you click on this button that says write a customer review. And you can write. You can give us hopefully five stars if we've earned it. You can add a brief headline, write your review, and you hit submit. It takes all of two minutes and it helps us get the word out about uh, ending Parkinson's disease. We're gonna take maybe one or two more questions here, uh, Rich, and then uh, I have a question for you. Um, uh, Julie Mayer asks, do you feel like you need to explain what's wrong with you when, uh, when people when you feel people are looking at you, people you just met or strangers, for example? Um, no, I, I try not to, to do that. I, I recognize I'm, I look funny sometimes, but uh, it's just something you deal with. I don't feel, I don't feel the need to explain it. I, I, if I'm having trouble sitting at a, at a, sitting at a table or at a restaurant or something, and I, I have trouble with, with my movements. I just tell people, so I have Parkinson's, I get over it. 
Um, Dan Keller asks, Colonel Clifford, in light of your loss of smell and taste, are there still particular foods that you enjoy? Yes, I, I like a good hamburger. <laughs> I still eat my ice cream. And uh, I got a couple, got a couple of comments that people say you should reconsider having holes drilled in your head. And that DBS uh, can be helpful. I guess some people have had a good experience. Uh, Dr. Jankovic is probably taking good care of you and let you know about uh, whether DBS is the right thing for you. I use Nina Browner. She's my. <laughs> So I, I want to end up uh, with this, uh, Rich. Uh, you've now had Parkinson's disease for one third of your life. One third of your life you've had Parkinson's disease. What do we need to do to end it? We need to, uh, hopefully, we're, we're gonna find a cure somewhere. Uh, we, there's a lot of research going on in that field. We want to we want to get away of, of having a you got to, to find a cure. You got to have a, you got to know the cause, and we, we haven't found the cause yet. We know we know that it's dopamine production, but what causes the lack of dopamine production? We still don't know. It could be these, the, the pesticides, and but that's that's going to solve the problem for the future. Uh, but there's still going to be a lot of people exposed to it now. Uh, get dark Parkinson's. Uh, um, I think I'm, I'm hoping for a, we'll find a cause. I mean, then we can focus our energy on finding a cure for the cause. We have two big causes, certain pesticides and this trichloroethylene. Those are two things that we can do to stop air pollution and heavy metals might be others that we can do to prevent. And then for people like you, we need to develop better treatments and ideally a cure. Uh, in the book, we detail a whole chapter on treatments that are being developed and certain, including treatments that are targeting the underlying causes of the disease. Uh, previous uh, pod, uh, webcasts uh, on that. I think the best message I've heard from you, uh, Rich, today is that we can't give up. Uh, you certainly didn't give up when you were diagnosed with Parkinson's disease 26 years ago. You flew into space, you walked into space, you worked for at least 10 more years while you had it. You produced a, docu uh, produced a documentary and given lectures around the country, if not the world, and you've shared your story with us generously today. We thank you very much for all of your efforts, both for the country, both for science, and for the entire Parkinson's community. It's people like you who changed the course of these diseases. Thank you, and don't give up. Thanks very much, Rich. Uh, next time we're gonna have uh, Michael Ogan is gonna be talking about uh, deep brain stimulation. So a lot of questions on deep brain deep brain simulation. Uh, Abby's going to put the date and time for that uh, talk uh, in the chat room right now, and I think it's next week. And then our Voices of Parkinson series continues. We've had uh, Ms. Lani Ali, we've had Rich Clifford, and on Thursday, June 18th at 2 p.m., Dr. Boss Bloom will be interviewing two former Olympians, two former Olympians, Davis Finney and Connie Carpenter Finney. Davis Finney founded the Davis Finney Foundation in 2015, and the White House recognized him as a champion for change. Um, and to, and I'm sorry, White, and White House recognized him as a champion for change for 2000 in 2015. Uh, next Wednesday, 12 noon Eastern, is our talk with Dr. Michael uh, Oaken on deep brain simulation. And Thursday, June 18th at 2 p.m. is our discussion with Davis Finney and his wife, Connie Carpenter Finney. With that, Rich Clifford, thank you very much again for all of your service and for all of your efforts on behalf of the Parkinson's community and on behalf of science and space exploration. A true delight and a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you for all your doing.